comments in the meeting. When the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via the internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Uh, to get it rolling, do we have any changes to the agenda? Nope. Uh, let's call, call to order then. Where's my, where's my TIFF? Right here. <laughs> Board President Shea? Um, I'm here. Excellent. Director Case? Here. Director Kilkenny? She texted me that she's having computer issues. Okay. So she, it looks like she's here as an attendant, as an attendee. Yeah. I'm going to counter. Can you, do you want to have her right here? Oh, she's yeah. home. Here. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Director Oyserman? Here. And Director Ruggieri? Here. Thanks. I think it like froze again. Sorry, the face. Oh, that's so cute, though. Okay. Before we get rolling with the rest of the agenda, we have resolution number 2021-08 making finding that the proclaimed state of emergency continues to impact the ability to meet safely in person and declaring that the board of directors fire commission and park and recreation commission will continue to meet remotely in order to ensure the health and safety of the public we need to approve this or not approve it go ahead right. uh, i move to approve <coughs> resolution 2021-08 i'll second it i was motioning you did so i'll just second you chris any comments about this Eric? Uh, well, I gave you a pretty detailed note. I mean, all of the conditions exist, which is why AB 361 was put into place. Uh, the primary move of this happening was that the governor's executive order uh, previously that remote meetings were held under was exactly that. This actually codifies it into law and makes an amendment to uh, the section of government code that's most popularly known as the Brown Act. The one kind of catch here that's still a little bit of a gray area, uh, but is being recommended is that no more than every 30 days, the board is supposed to reaffirm that these conditions still exist and uh, redeclare that you will continue with remote meetings. Uh, that might get extended out. Uh, I think they're realizing that for groups that only meet once a month, that puts a hamper into things. But as of right now, um, our legal counsel is still advising every 30 days uh, not to exceed. We revisit this. So on months where we have five Tuesdays, that's going to present a challenge in the following month because we'll actually be 35 days out uh, or so instead of 28. So we'll cross that bridge, but the December meeting would be the first 51. So, uh, would we need we to have, do a special session to just um, call we, in and do this? We might. Um, okay. Hopefully we have more clarity by that time, uh, but this will carry us for this. And then the November meeting, um, I'll have something similar on the agenda, just stating where it's at. Otherwise, any questions or discussion, I'm happy to entertain them the best I can. Well, I mean, the only thing that I, I'm thinking is, do you think our governor or the legislature would make the change ahead of time? Uh, they change? won't change. AB 361, which is what this is based on, is actually written to carry through until January of 2024. Um, what, the two things that could change is if the governor withdraws his uh, uh, declared state of emergency or if local health uh, makes changes to uh, recommending social distancing. Those are the two key factors. All you need is one of those. Both of those still exist uh, at this point in time. I don't know that I see that changing anytime immediately soon, but you know, the optimist in me would like to think so. Uh, I'll certainly keep the board apprised if and when that happens, and I'm sure you'll see it all over the news as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody I just like it for the fact that I think more people can attend our meetings because they don't have to leave their homes. Oh, that means we'll have a bunch of the public chiming in then? But potentially. <laughs> or we won't have computer problems if we go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and unfortunately, we just don't really have the resources nor the technology to do a hybrid meeting. There was also legislation passed that once this all goes, um, that counties in large cities, uh, I believe over 75,000 mm -hmm. in population, are going to be required to do a, uh, a hybrid meeting, meaning an in-person location as well as a real-time remote access. Um, there's a reason that it's only large cities and counties, uh, just because most small cities and certainly the vast majority of special districts just don't have that technology nor the resources to put that technology in place. Mm -hmm. I do agree with Chris, though. I think, you know, it does give at least more of an opportunity for, you know, additional members to join. There's hope. Everybody can zoom on their phone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, did you call for public comment, Bill? After everybody else is done, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, then once again, for public comment, you can use the raise hand feature. I don't see any public comment at this time, Bill. Awesome. Uh, then I'll call for a vote. Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I guess that means we'll adopt the agenda as it is, and then now we move on to the consent calendar. <clears throat> draft minutes of the regular meeting and the draft minutes of the special meeting that we entertained, and the bills paid. I had a couple. Oh, let's see here. Where was that? Can I ask a question while you're looking? Go ahead. May I ask which of the tennis courts were resurfaced? Uh, Luke, you want to take that? Um, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So uh, courts one and two, the two courts closest to the street on Miller Creek got um, cracks were filled and, and they got a new uh, top coat put on. Um, this isn't like a full dig out and re, you know, uh, do it's just more of a uh, bandaid. Um, but they got, they got redone. Those last for a while there. They look really good. And then uh, courts three and four down closer to the middle school um, got just a few patches done. There were a few holes that, that uh, they went out there and took, filled and took care of. And then Creekside Court, uh, Creekside Park also got the same treatment um, as the courts one and two. So I'm also okay. got a new top coat and cracks filled. So. Okay, because I know a while ago we had talked about the possibility of needing to redo that was really the kind of patch and just resurface. That's it. Yeah, I'll talk more about that in my report. Um, so okay. we'll wrap with all those, but I'm that's correct. All right. Where's then, the court? Creekside Court? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, where's the Creekside Court? It's on Creekside Drive um, at oh. the Creekside Park. <laughs> it's in Lucas, Lucas Valley Estate. It's at the park in Lucas Valley Estate. Okay, I figured I just wasn't sure, but thanks, Luke. <laughs> so, I didn't mean to, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, Luke, that was seven, seven grand for all of that, right? That's yeah. what it looks like. And then, how long do you think 
<laughs> How long do you think it'll last? Um, well, that, I think that just reflects the initial uh, deposit. The codes are more expensive than that. Um, we'll have the second installment, I think, in the next consent calendar. Is that right, Eric? Okay. Um, but the, the top code is, um, we expect to last uh, about three to four years, depending on the weather. Um, right now, with the drought, um, the courts have been taking a toll. The things have been, uh, the courts have been in bad shape because of the lack of moisture. Um, and so it's hard to predict, but we've been getting about three years out of the courts when we do this treatment. We've got them on a, a cycling basis to, to keep them all kind of in good shape. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we normally don't do that many at once, too. Uh, we actually didn't do this uh, scheduled work last fiscal year, which is also why uh, Creekside was done at the same time. Uh, you know, to Luke's point, we usually uh, address one court per year, kind of at a three to five year rotating basis. And uh, the work didn't happen uh, as anticipated last year. Uh, and so this year we did a little bit more than we normally would in a given year, but now they're all in good shape. Okay. And then the bills to uh, Murray Building and uh, in, uh, Bill Hansel, uh, that's, was that the first payment to Murray? No, uh, that was the second payment to Murray. And everything is done. Um, you know, he, he submits, you know, work to date and then the architect signs off on it that, yep, this has been completed, it's been completed satisfactory. And then there's a retention uh, to that too. So it's all the, everything up to date. And then I believe it's either five or 10% retention. I think it's a 5% quote me. And then uh, all that'll come through at the very end of the project. All right. Thank you. Yep. That's all I had. Anybody else? You just asked online, so. Anything from the public? You have no public comment though. Really? Uh, okay. On to E. Oh, wait, we have to approve the consent. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a motion? A motion to approve the consent calendar as written. Okay. The draft. Oh. Sorry. No. I okay. Go ahead. For the draft minutes of the regular meeting from September 14th, 2021, the draft meeting minutes from the special meeting of October 5th, 2021, and the bill is paid. Just a second. A call for a vote. For President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Razorman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, now on to public comment. Open time for items not on the agenda. Looking for any raised hands, and you have none, Bill. <laughs> Uh, district matters. Let's see, we got a resolution number 2021-09 approving memorandum of understanding between the Marinwood Community Services District and Marinwood Professional Firefighters pertaining to the compensation and working conditions. I'm just so happy that we're able to vote an approval on this. Uh, Eric? Yeah, um, before I get into any of this, I, you know, I just, I want to acknowledge just, you know, sitting at the table as the district representative and working with uh, the representatives of the firefighter group, I was just uh, really, uh, you know, I don't know what the right term is, appreciative. Uh, it was a very open, it was a very communicative, um, honest uh, process. Um, it was, you know, very good to work with them. I, I think that both sides really listened to what was important to the other sides. Uh, and truth be told, um, even though uh, it seems like a long time passed, it was through, it wasn't a lot of meetings and we were able to get to this agreement. So I just want to acknowledge that, uh, how much I appreciated their willingness to listen and their willingness to be open and candid. Um, and it was just a really good, smooth process. And Sean Day, who serves as the uh, shop steward, was very communicative uh, with me throughout all of it. Um, and the other gentleman who sat on the uh, negotiating committee for the firefighters, uh, they were it was just it was a very good um, healthy process to go through with them so thank you to them um, i also want to acknowledge that uh, and i'll get into some of the highlights here but this agreement has been ratified by the firefighters so they have already signed off on it and their attorney has signed off on it so this approval tonight would be the final step in this process and then it will go into place um, and it will last the term of this agreement is actually for a three-year term this is going to take effect uh, essentially july 1st of 2021 that's already passed and it won't expire until june 30th 2024 um, as i wrote in here the mou is really the guiding document um, that guides their wages and working conditions uh, throughout the course of the mou obviously we also have a uh, employee handbook and personnel uh, policies um, but the mou uh, anything that's addressed in the mou overrides that um, the wage increases, I, I listed them out as percentages, as you can see by rank. Um, and I also tried to go through and uh, list out what some of the non-economic items were. A lot of this was kind of language cleanup um, and just kind of a reassessment of one role in particular being the maintenance role versus the fire staff administrative role. Um, that really kind of came to light, especially after the retirement of our in-house fire chief and recognizing that we could use a little bit more help on that side here. Um, so this makes a lot of sense um, for both sides for us to do. Uh, and they were amenable to it. Um, and I think happy about it. Um, on the second page uh, where you see the fiscal impact, I have this broken down in a couple of different ways. And I tried to get fairly detailed, separating out wages versus pension expense and taxes. And you can see what the incremental increase amount is, meaning uh, you know, what is anticipated and estimated to be added to the budget on a year over year basis as a result of this MOU. Um, I do want to point out, and I feel I should, that the uh, law, you add it incrementally year over year, you know, the total incremental cost is $126,753, but you have to remember that these amounts compound. So 42,000 for year one also goes into year two and adds that to the 41,000 in year one and year two, add into the year three uh, increase. So you have a total cost increase anticipated at um, just over $253,000 over the life of this three year agreement. Um, this cost will come out of the general fund. There's not dedicated funding for this uh, or for. Uh, or employment that we have, um, but working within the budget, I do feel comfortable and confident that we can uh, afford this cost and work into our budget without sacrificing any other uh, costs or needs throughout the district. Um, and then I do, you know, I put something here at the end, and I think it's important to point out that, you know, I think we all recognize Marinwood is the smallest fire department, uh, professionally staffed fire department in the county, uh, and our guys are also the lowest paid professional firefighters in the county. Even with these increases, they're going to remain at or near the bottom of their comparative wage scale when looking at much larger fire departments and agencies than we are. Um, I'm very comfortable with this amount. I think that this is a fair agreement. I think it uh, represents what the district, you know, can afford and feel comfortable to do, and I think that they've certainly earned it. Um, and I, I just think very highly of our firefighters, and they work very strong uh, for the community. So with that, my recommendation is very solid to adopt resolution 2021-09 as presented which essentially approves this three-year MOU. Thank you. Any comments? Any comments from the public? Looking for raised hands and you have none, Bill. Well then, I'd like a motion to approve. I motion to approve resolution 2021-09 um, approving the memorandum of understanding between the Marine Community Service District and the Marine Professional Firefighters pertaining to compensation and working conditions. I'll second. Thank you. Call for a vote, Tiff. Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oizerman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you. District Manager Report. 
Uh, let me flip some pages here. I'm going to run along here. Um, so just a few items that I had put in there of interest uh, and things that I've been working on. Uh, one of the ones I want to bring up, and I know it has come up a, uh, a couple of times at a couple of meetings regarding the place structure replacement project for Marinewood Park. Um, this is still in the early stages of the grant process. I'll be filing the initial application or project application. Uh, they've already received our resolution for funding. We've already been approved for funding. This is just to formally approve the project. Um, and just as a reminder, that the Park and Rec Commission uh, recommended this project to the board, which was subsequently approved and the funds authorized for the specific use by the board at your February 2021 board meeting. So we've been working on it since then. Um, this initial project application is due in December, but my goal is to have it submitted by the end of this month. Um, one quick note on the Miller Creek Trail feasibility report. I have made contact with a couple of uh, professionals uh, that are somewhat in the area. One is actually based out of Santa Cruz, another one is based out of Sonoma County. Both of them have expressed interest. We've sent them the initial materials, and I'm still waiting for an initial proposal. So hopefully, we have a more solid update on that next month. Um, you know, not a deep pool of people who do this kind of work, and everybody's pretty busy. So, but they did both express interest in responding. So I'll be following up on it here shortly. Um, and then one other note, mostly because it came up at the last board meeting um, at the bottom um, regarding cell coverage concerns in Lucas Valley. Uh, I did uh, and have spoken with Supervisor Connolly's office about this, and the uh, emergency manager for the Santa Fe Fire Department, named uh, President Quinn Gordon, also uh, reached out to the Office of Emergency Services uh, for Marin County who also has some connections uh, you know, with the regulatory agencies and Conway also has some connections with some of the providers uh, and both of them have offered to uh, at least look into this and do what they can. Obviously their authority is strained, um, but just wanted to let them know that there are other parties that are working on and hopefully trying to pursue this to some degree of success is unknown yet. Uh, otherwise, if there's any other questions, the only other thing I would say is uh, just earlier today, uh, we blasted some announcements uh, via social media regarding upcoming commission term appointments. Typically we appoint in November for terms that start in January. We do have uh, multiple opportunities on both commissions, uh, both from commissioners whose terms are ending and I'm not sure if they'll be reapplying yet as well as uh, just some currently vacant spots that could be filled. Uh, I did have one member of the community reach out uh, in regards to the PNR commission was interested in learning more so uh, we will see where that goes and then hopefully uh, through some of our blasts on social media next door and like we get a little bit of interest and uh, i have some people to present to the board next month uh, for potential appointment to both commissions awesome thank you yeah. any comments maybe we should you know mention to uh Zeman and have quinn also reach out again say we had another fire today well, i'm sure he's well aware <laughs> <laughs> hint, 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 hint. sorry anything any, any comments from the public for raised hands i don't see any bill there's no comment wow okay thank you eric uh, on to fire matters okay we've got <clears throat> to approve two agreements can we do them both at the same time or one at a time i would prefer we do them one at a time um okay. just uh, some background especially for the board members who weren't here this time last year uh, these are annual agreements they're very much the for they're formulaic and how they're set we have been uh, having these agreements in place probably for 30 plus years at least um how they're calculated is very set in stone it's a fairly complex yet uh, annually used formulas for both csa 13 as well as the county facilities the juvenile hall site and rotary village which is the other agreement um, as you see in my little note here you know i put together estimates on what i believe that they will come out to be back in you know may when the board approves the budget um final reconciliations and contracts are actually slightly above on the csa 13 contract it's a little over fourteen thousand dollars uh, higher than estimated in terms of total revenue and a little over twelve hundred dollars for the county facility. So you're looking at about a fifteen thousand uh, dollar revenue uh, increase from what I anticipated six months ago. Okay. So we need an approval on the agreement between the County of Marin and Marinwood Community Services District for the fire protection and emergency services to County Service Area 13. That would be great. Yeah. So we need somebody motion. We have to ask for public comment first. Uh, you can motion, you just can't take a vote until you ask for public comment. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, I, I would certainly move uh, that we approve the agreement between County Marin and Marin Community Services District for the Fire Protection and Emergency Services to CSA 13. Thank you. I'll second. Cool. Any comments from the public? You have no public comment, though. Oh. Uh, call for a vote. Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oizerman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Next up is the agreement between the County of Marin and Marin Community Services District for Fire Protection and Emergency Services for the Juvenile Hole Site. And we need a, a motion to approve on this one also. Uh, I move to approve the agreement between the County of Marin and Marinwood Community Services District for fire protection and emergency services for the juvenile hall site. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Any comments? <laughs> Any comments from the public? You have no public comment, Bill. Uh, I'll call for a vote. Board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oizerman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Thank you all. Now we have a discussion and potential appointment of Marinwood Board Director to serve as Marinwood representative on the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority Board of Directors. Currently, I'm sitting on that board. It's been very, very interesting, but. And you do a great job. <laughs> it's so on sits as the, uh, as the alternate and uh, she has filled in in that role a couple times. There is not a requirement to appoint uh, any or replace any new people or even to reaffirm appointment. There are no term limits uh, or how long they can stand. This is at the uh, discretion of the local agencies that are members of the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority. It just had been a year um, since these last appointments were made. So in talking with President Shea, we thought that we should always put it on there to see if there's any other interest amongst any other board members on joining this. And um, the meetings are typically a monthly on the third Thursday of each month at three o'clock. They have been remote. I don't, uh, you know, at some point they'll have to go back to in person. I don't know if they have an in-person location, but again, I don't see that happening immediately anytime soon. Uh, so I said a list of possible board actions, uh, which could be, you know, appoint a Marinewood CSD board director to replace President Shea to serve as the primary rep, uh, appoint a Marinewood CSD board director to replace Director Oyserman serving as the alternate, uh, or you could replace them both, or you can take no action whatsoever, which essentially keeps them both in their current roles, should they be so willing. Any comments anywhere along the line? <laughs> Are you willing? Yeah. No, right. it's, been, it's been more than interesting. It's a voluminous uh, reading material every, every month. That's all I can say about it. They, they, are, they have meetings, uh, executive board meetings, 
at least three or four a month. And what comes out of all of that is, uh, it's a lot of reading material to keep up with. That's all. It's more than interesting though. But if somebody wants to be the alternate, they haven't sent any reading material my way. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm happy to continue on as this, but if you want to be an alternate. And the yeah, couple meetings that I went to, because during tax season, <laughs> Dale tends to bow out, or if tax season gets moved, those are the only times that you are definitely the one yeah. who's in charge, which is fine. It's hard to get away. I'm not in charge of the taxes in our household, so it's okay. That's, I am too. <laughs> are we in tax right now, technically, since it was extended? I wasn't interested in anything. There's a 15 deadline. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. It sounds interesting to me, but the three o'clock kills it for me either. I can't get out for that. Yeah, three o'clock's a hard one. I just make sure that I'm out of the office and, and <laughs> able to get on to the computer then. That's yeah. all. Uh, maybe next time around. It's a reminder. You know, if, if everybody's good with it, I'm good with it. So cool. I'm good with staying alternate. Thanks, okay. guys. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will say one thing to think about is around this time next year, uh, depending on whether they decide to rerun for election or not run for election uh, or not be elected or whatever the case may be, uh, just recognizing that both Bill and Savant's term on the board ends next November, a year from now. So uh, somebody may very well need to replace them depending on the outcome of that. Yeah, somewhere along the line. I Thanks. understand they're both going to run again, but. Yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, we love our meetings with you guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> should we call I would miss you guys this many faces. Well, if there's no motion, you should ask for public comment. But if there's no I was motion, just headed towards public comment. Shall we? Any raised hands? You have no public comment. Wow, golly. And we are going to review the draft minutes of the fire commission meeting. Uh, well, can we just close this out and just make a note that there was no motion? So, uh, formally, right. uh, both uh, President Shea will remain as the uh, as the primary representative, and Director Oishman will remain as the alternate representative to the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority Board. Sounds great. Good. Thank you. Now you give it one. Sorry, Bill. Oh, uh, draft minutes of the fire commission meeting. Any comments? Um, can I chime in here for a second? Sure. Bill? Um, we have heard commentary um, in the past, uh, at least I've received comments in the past from members of the public who feel that the board is not uh, informed on what's happening at the commissions, uh, primarily because of the format of our action minutes, um, which are done this way uh, via a formal amendment of our bylaws and action of the board. Uh, I actually have had shared some communications, uh, and I do want to remind uh, the public and uh, the board, obviously, who knows, we do have each commission as a board liaison who is appointed to those commissions uh, and represents the board to the commission and in turn can represent uh, initiatives and uh, discussions from the commission to the board with it desired. Our board liaison to our fire commission is uh, Director Kathleen Polkenny. Our board liaison to the Park and Rec Commission is Director Lisa Ruggieri. I will say they both regularly attend meetings. I, I can think of maybe one meeting in the past year that uh, either one has missed from their commissions. Uh, we were communicating since the last meeting, the three of us, um, and just kind of trying to think about this. And beginning with next month, we thought what might be helpful to do is when we go through the minutes, the board liaisons to the commissions will provide a brief verbal update and report to the board regarding uh, just some of the actions isn't really the right term, but just you know what the commissions are working on, what some of the items of uh, significance were that were being discussed and anything else that they think may be of interest to the board. So we will start that with next meeting uh, and Director Ruggieri obviously will report on the PNR and Director Kilkenny will give a brief verbal report on fire commission. And we thought that could be a good way to uh, help keep the board and the public informed of the happenings of those meetings as well. That's awesome. I, I actually had a couple of uh, notes here on it. And one of them was uh, the chair requesting uh, the local open space fire roads and their ability to accommodate. I mean, how many different fire roads do we have in the district and the open space? Uh, we have one primarily, and uh, obviously that's Queenstone, I can, right? that's Queenstone. I can let Chief White speak to this. Um, there was certainly some discussion, and if Chief White wants to um, uh, chime in on this, uh, he probably has a better understanding of what was being asked on it than I do. I'm just curious. Good evening, directors. Yes, this is Darren White, and I'm glad to be back. Sorry, it's been a little delay. I had a, a surgical procedure, and so far it seems successful. So uh, to the question about the fire roads, I think um, there was some concern um, regarding whether or not the fire roads have been maintained, I believe, and whether or not the fire roads um, are apparatus to traverse those fire roads and get to any and every location they needed to. And from what I understand, the apparatus were actually um, very capable of traversing all those fire roads. Uh, I don't know if there's been any recent grading or anything else that help ensure that those roads are in an optimal condition, but I'm going to assume that they're in fairly great condition from what I've heard. Um, the apparatus, such as the tank wagons, which are smaller, um, quicker mobile units that actually can go up and uh, get to some of these locations that are fairly remote, those smaller vehicles have off road capability and they're, they're actually capable of doing it, as well as uh, another vehicle con considered to be what's called a Type 3, which also has pump and roll capability and is able to navigate. Um, fairly uh, unique terrain. Uh, you just, there's some considerations to using fire roads and also ensuring that, um, you know, that the engineer who's responsible understands where not to place those units in the event of an active incident. Um, but that being said, they learn a lot of that when they're on their strike team deployments and they're actually um, some very skilled and experienced individuals in our organization, one of which is actually in our report right now, Captain Brackett. So anyway, I'll just, I'll say that for now, unless there's any specific questions. No, I was, I know they graded Queenstone a couple, uh, three years ago, I think, because up to that point, it was, it was iffy if any equipment could get up there the way the erosion was on that road. Um, but I, I've walked it, I walk it all the time. So I, currently it's graded nicely. So, right. um, and then, might say it's a little steep, but. and I guess Ron was asking a question on the uh, the range of neighborhoods evacuated was larger than it seemingly needed. Is that? Um, you on, know, I would say September first fire. I think depending on what the officials see at that moment in time, uh, whether it be active fire activity, the direction that they believe it may be going in, or potentially what the wind conditions have been, whether or not there's going to be potential for embers to drop in other locations uh, adjacent to the fire, I think all of these things start to be a consideration. And so, to err on the side of evacuating more than necessary, I don't see a real problem or concern with that. Um, I think also, you know, one of the side benefits of doing something like that is that you actually are in a position to practice evacuation. And so if there's going to be any impediments or any, um, any real issues or challenges with bottlenecking or something else, that would be a good time to actually see it. I mean, you didn't really truly need to fully evacuate under an exact emergency. But um, I would err on the side of being cautious just because of the unknowns and the things that can you know, suddenly transpire in an active wildfire incident. All right. Thank you.
that was all I had. On that Director video. Oyserman has something, I think. Yeah, I was surprised also that the NOAA radios didn't provide an alert. And I don't understand what it means that it's not to target smaller communities. I mean, I thought the whole point, I mean, there's not going to be a Marin-wide fire, right? Well, I think I mean, that's like, part isn't of it, because I mean, it would become Marin-wide if we didn't stop this. So like, I don't know, I, I'm a little <laughs> confused also. I think that from my recollection, the NOAA radios were designed to actually give a, a heads up to a, a wide swath of individuals who may be in a, the path of a fast moving incident. Something that's got to be fairly catastrophic or looks like it's growing exponentially and it's going to be a major threat to multiple communities. So I think. Um, they don't want to inundate people with notices about smaller incidents that may be fairly well contained or they may have confidence it's going to be resolved without crossing multiple jurisdictions, as an example. So I think um, NOAA is going to be selective about when they actually put information out to the users just to make sure they don't create a situation where people suddenly aren't paying attention to NOAA um, notifications. I, I totally get it, but I think that we need to then be clear if we're going to have people have these, because I think people might think, well, my NOAA thing didn't tell me to evacuate, so I don't need to evacuate. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you were told to evacuate, but that didn't go off, but we were told that this is in case something happens and you need to know about it, and this was something that happened. Like, we need to then be specific about, I mean, I got like alerts on high winds, but not about. The fire down the street. Yeah, I'm think, yeah. Can I just interject? I think that, and Eric did a little bit more research as well, was that it was more driven by weather, not fire conditions. And that's why. So that's why you're getting the weather, you know, the wind versus just Marinwood's fire, because yeah. then it will go off in Mill Valley. It will go off in Sausalito. It will go off in everywhere. And I agree with him. Like, I'll start ignoring it. If I'm like, oh, yeah. the thing in Fairfax, that doesn't affect me. Not yet, at least. But you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, so. I, I, yeah. Oh, we just need to make sure that we're very clear to people. But I don't know how many people have them right now. Well, the point of this thing was to see if it would work. And then they wanted to recommend that everybody would get one. That was the point of this little test. Yeah. Right. I mean, At least when I was in the other fire commission, that was yeah. changed. Yeah, I just think, you know, again, the key there is it's, you know, they're intended to be used for major events. I did reach out to Fire Safe Marin. Um, you know, they made sure to reiterate that when they do a broadcast, it's all over uh, most of parts of Marin County, even into Sonoma County. And when you have an incident like you had down the road, it causes a lot of confusion as well for somebody who's many, many, many miles away and is not in any way, shape, or form impacted. But all of a sudden, there's, you know, evacuation alerts start going through. Um, I, I do think, to your point, Savon, that just making sure uh, that people understand what the intent of the NOAA radio is and continuing to encourage people on things like Alert Marin and Nexel and, and the other uh, that can be much more localized to very specific communities. So typically a wind event does affect a large region of area too so do you know how long the testing is going on the pilot program i really don't okay and i don't know what the uh, results of it have been or what the final outcome or if this is uh, you know the pilot program may very well show that for these you know that could, it could be one of the findings for these localized events the NOAA radios aren't what you should be relying on but for larger scale events uh, weather or natural uh, disaster related the NOAA radios can prove to be a useful tool uh, especially you know things like power outages or whatever that's why they have battery backup and can continue to broadcast information when you've lost power you've lost internet you've lost phone hey bill do you mind asking in your next uh, meeting asking what how long the pilot program or oh. we have to get feedback since we just had an incident or because I like and we'll get to it since you report there's so many different avenues Alert Marin, Zone Haven like there's so many different avenues also to check that you know I, I, wanted I, to see. I can reach out to Fire Safe Marin staff to find out a little bit more about the pilot program and what the parameters are um, I'm not sure that the MWPA board is really going to have a lot of detail about that so we don't have anything to do with NOAA right so I'll look into it on my end with Fire Safe Marin staff thank you you're welcome anything else I guess that means we're going to go on to the chief officer report and activity summary well, this is a good segue right into the first topic. Um, Zone Haven, the emergency evacuation platform is actually live now on the Marin County Emergency Portal. And so it's actually ready to use there. The application itself is not ready yet. I understand that it may be launched sometime in 2022, perhaps in the spring of 2022. Um, in the interim, there's uh, some information that's being pushed out to uh, end users and they're encouraging it. And this current report, I actually did something I, I seldom do, which is I created the link so that you could click onto it and actually uh, see video and some of the frequently asked questions, the talking points, and other information that just may be interesting. I think one of the videos kind of uh, demonstrates the first responder utility of the, the um, Zone Haven platform and that they're able to make real-time um, decisions based on conditions they're encountering. And so with that video, it kind of speaks to some of the things we've talked to in the past about real-time situational awareness, using the Waze application and making decisions based on uh, the various zones that are identified that may be in need of evacuation and how that gets communicated out to Alert Marin and others to now push back out to the communities that may be affected. And so with that, um, I certainly encourage all of you to take uh, a look at some of this information. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, for the next time that uh, we meet, I'll certainly be willing to share some of the frequently asked questions. Or if you have any questions right now, for that matter, I can provide what answers I can. Um, but I think the information that's there is uh, pretty comprehensive and gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on with the Zone Haven platform. It's been recently acquired by another Marin County agency called Genesis. And so it looks like the Zone Haven platform is going to really expand and provide a lot of value added to all the different counties within our region who are utilizing Zone Haven currently, which includes uh, Sonoma, Contra Costa, Alameda County, San Mateo County, you name it, the list goes, goes on and on. One of the benefits of that is that the, the adjacent counties now will receive information about something that may be taking place on their border or perimeter within the neighboring jurisdiction so that they can be aware and see is this really going to have the potential to affect communities with our, within our county as well. So as you learn a bit more about that, um, I think you'll see the utility and the value. Certainly the Know Your Zone campaign is something that I encourage everyone to go and take a look at and, and get familiar with your zone and understand if something were to take place in your area. Um, what, where, where would you go and how? Uh, the Zone Haven itself does not provide you with the information on evacuation and where to go. It's actually the Waze application that provides you with that information. And so while Zone Haven is not capable of, of giving you that detail, you can rely on the Waze app right now until the Zone Haven app is available. So, uh, and Waze is going to direct you away from any incident. So it's going to utilize real-time traffic conditions and information it has about any bottlenecks or pinch points that may be experienced and the incident itself. So just a couple of, of things to consider as you look at the Zone Haven and its value as it moves forward. One of the other things I speak to about it is that it's it's utilized a lot of information from existing or previously existing um, data regarding the mapping and, and the other zones that have been previously developed by numerous agencies within the county going back to, I believe, 2005 and then again, more recently, 2016. And so Zone Haven has done an excellent job of reaching out to a variety of the stakeholders who had previous involvement in mapping to ensure that what they were developing was uh, in consideration of all those efforts that came before it. So just uh, it's force multiplied now by that much more with the Zone Haven technology and, and their efforts. Um, and I think I mentioned this to the, the 
prior commission that you know one of the individuals who was a key contributor to that is none other than Matt Sampson, who was a former Marinewood uh, volunteer who's now a deputy chief in South San Francisco, someone that I'm very familiar with over the years doing our uh, work in special operations. And so uh, we got a local young man that's done really well, and he's uh, been an integral part of that Zone Haven platform and how it's successfully launched in San Mateo County. Moving forward, I'm going to speak to just some of the highlights in the report. Um, one of the things that we look at with COVID-19 recently is that um, the Marin County officials spoke to, or should I say, um, were present at a conference uh, for the International City and County Management Association, ICMA, in Portland, Oregon recently. And they were one of 11 counties or cities that was highlighted for best practices as it pertained to some of the things involving COVID and COVID response. And I think I've mentioned this multiple times in the past about how well Marin County's done in comparison to other jurisdictions. But to be recognized um, by this very um, astute organization says a whole lot about what's taking place with Marin County and that um, we've been utilizing best practices. We've actually been doing some of the things that take a look at the, the ability to provide testing vaccination from a lens of equity and inclusion and leveraging existing relationships and, and some of those things that maybe others would have been slow to be able to engage on had they not already had in place what Marin County officials have had in, uh, in place. And so with that, um, as an example, we spoke to the Latinx community, 98% uh, within Marin County have been vaccinated. And that's been through no accident. They brought the testing and the vaccination directly to the communities they thought would be most impacted. And so that's a very high rate of success. And you think about um, the idea that Marin County may very well be the, the highest vaccinated rate of a community anywhere in the country and still doing very well when it comes to infection and or um, that's compared to any other jurisdiction within the country. That speaks volumes about everyone's understanding of what needed to be done and why and taking a very proactive approach. One of the other things worth noting is that uh, well over 1,300 county disaster service workers, 1,300 employees stepped up and just took on responsibilities with food service and with testing, with actual vaccination assistance at various sites. And so we look at this and, and county officials have realized they've learned a whole lot in this pandemic on how to provide services to the community. And so some best practices, I'm sure, have emerged from this that they're going to utilize any adventures in other future catastrophe or similar situation we may encounter somewhere down the road. So again, kudos to everyone here in Marin County for making sure that we're a lot safer than we normally probably would have been had it not been for everyone's proactive approach. Um, vaccine, vaccine verification and testing required for first responders. I think um, as of September 15th, almost a month ago now, there was an order uh, provided that became effective uh, requiring first responders to actually be vaccinated and or provide um, for weekly testing uh, in the workplace to ensure that there were no exposures and or potential for other individuals to be exposed. And so this was a strange thing that it took so long. If you think about the fact that back in July, um, the CDC, or excuse me, the CDPH, California Department of Public Health, required in late July that healthcare workers, including those in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, um, multiple clinics, homeless shelters, in a variety of locations, had already required those staff to be fully vaccinated. Well, for some reason, I, and it's guessed, you know, it's, it's supposed perhaps it was a political thing because of the recall and whatever else may have been happening at the state level. Um, the order never really spoke to first responders, especially fire service personnel who come in direct contact in most cases on a regular basis with patients who are either at these facilities or en route to these facilities. And so um, the order finally came, but there's a, a I'll just say an effort underway right now to further push this order into mandated vaccination for those first responding agencies, especially the fire service. So this is going to become a, a point of contention that's already surfacing in multiple locations, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, and other jurisdictions, where certain first responders are pushing back on the idea of being vaccinated. But um, there's going to be more to follow with that because I think ultimately, in my own opinion, professional opinion and personal, is that we can't pose a risk or an undue risk to the, the community that trust us to serve and provide uh, service to them safely and or to those we work alongside who are potentially going to carry a, a um a virus back home to our families or to our loved ones or elsewhere. And so with that, this is really going to reach a, a crescendo at some point, I'm pretty sure. But the question is how soon and when. Um, so more to follow on that at, at some future point. Uh, I got a few photos that I shared of the, the uh, Caldor fire and some of our staff, including Captain Ryan Brackett, who was in one of the photos uh, when they did a group picture. He's at the top left of the photo. You can't really see him that clearly, but he was uh, one of the experts uh, on the scene that helped out uh, as they were trying to prevent that fire from getting, uh, or should I say, affecting South Lake Tahoe. And we received a, a very, very warm letter, if you will, of, of appreciation from the battalion chief who served as strike team leader. And spoke so highly of the effort of the, the crews that responded there and how they worked under really difficult situations without a lot of sleep, um, very uncomfortable, um, just difficult terrain. Uh, you name it, they were facing it. They, they, no one had a negative attitude or any um, adverse comments or, or you know, just, just show professionalism and diligence throughout. And so it's just something to be commended when they maintain morale and continue to perform at a high level under very challenging circumstances for a two-week period. So hats off to Captain Brackett and the others that responded to assist on that incident. And as uh, Director Weisserman referred to earlier, there was a, another couple of incidents that occurred. One right after I actually went out on leave, um, which we'll know was the last fire. And Fortunately for us, we had a very quick response, um, and that quick response involved our own uh, Engine 58 crew and multiple uh, mutual aid agencies, as well as the Marin County Sheriff's Office and Cal Fire Air Units. Um, you know, I've seen the air units do impressive things, and I, I believe they've done something impressive here as well. They had four air tankers and two helicopters. That's a massive response in a very short period of time. Um, I've only seen two air tankers and one helicopter where their homes threatened in my previous jurisdiction and not far from where I live now. But to have four air tankers on the scene said they wanted to knock this quickly, and they actually, uh, from what I understand, did their drops with precision, as they have been known to do. And so... Um, from what I understand, the fire started initially and had maybe about four or five acres, but ended up totally burning about 45 acres in all. And our personnel remained, excuse me, on scene for the next couple of days, ensuring that there were no hot spots or potential for additional fire spread. And as mentioned earlier, um, I know there was some concern about the, the number of evacuations, but again, I would, I would always err on the side of being cautious and not um, suddenly find ourselves behind the eight ball because we didn't get enough people out as soon as we could have. Uh, it's always easier to send people back. And by the way, that's another thing that the Zone Haven platform will do, is it'll let individuals know when it's safe to return home. So it'll provide them with updates and information that can be referenced um, for those who are trying to get back home as, as soon as they're possibly able to get back home. Um, fire cause in this case was determined to be machinery. Apparently, some mowing equipment um, somewhere near the school district property uh, may have caused a spark. And you know, when you've got low humidity and, and it's a windy condition day and, and it's a very warm day, that's a, uh, a recipe for potential disaster. And so we, we were able to avert disaster, fortunately. Um, on the other end of that, Captain uh, Papa Nicolau, he's going to conduct our after action review with some of the staff just to kind of discuss some of the, the lessons learned uh, on the initial response and throughout the incident command. So there'll be more to follow on that. And if anyone has any interest in knowing about what those lessons learned are, I'll be more than happy to share those after the after action report takes place. Director Raceman, you have a question or is that you? you I like want to know. <laughs> okay. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so with that, um, that actually concludes my report, unless someone has some other quest
And it was right after school got out. And I'm just wondering, had that fire gone? Like, do we, as a firefighting district plus the school district, is there some coordination for things? I mean, clearly this needs to be something that they are talking. I just, I'm playing it out there hoping that you're going to say, oh, yes, the school board and school district and the fire district have talked about this. And there are clear guidelines on evacuation for the kiddos. I will say there's probably been previous discussions prior to my tenure here in, in Marinwood. So I would like to leverage and, and learn a bit about those discussions and what traction was made there and then build on those. Yeah. Um, but I do know also that I've had recent conversations with Queen Gardner, our emergency manager in San Rafael. And I've talked to her about my concerns about vulnerable populations and vulnerable areas of our communities that I believe need consideration moving forward, whether they be the seniors or they be the youth, and how we can effectively ensure we have plans in place to evacuate those individuals who may not be able to get out in the instance of a fast moving fire. And so yeah. with that, that'll be part of some upcoming conversations. You know, how do we either shelter in place successfully or how do we position ourselves to ensure that we have the right resources going where they need to go immediately when we call on them because we, we recognize that there's a need. Yeah, um, I have to say, depending on the situation, you know, it could be that we decide to stand and draw a line and, and keep the kids sheltered in place because it may not be feasible or possible to evacuate immediately. And so um, I think every firefighter understands the value of protecting our youth. And so I just want to say that yeah. um, given that. Um, and just three schools within like that area that got evacuated. And I was just thinking like, had the kids been in school and the evacuation notice gone into effect, like how would that have? Yeah, it, it could have been an initial shelter in place to put units in place to ensure that there's a wall, if you will, to stop anything from affecting the buildings and or the students until such time that they can be evacuated successfully and then move forward with a firefight. Okay. So it may be more of a defensive posture at that point as opposed to an offensive posture. It could be a combination of things. But again, it really depends on the incident on what you're going to want to do and what you're going to want to set up. Um, given the information you have at that moment in time and given what's taking place, you know, when it comes to the lives you're trying to protect. So I don't have an exact answer, unfortunately, I think, um, but I can't find out some more about, you know, what discussions have been held before, what drills have been held, what conversations have been held about um, potential pre-plans and what we can do to ensure that one way or another, there's a plan in place already for all three of those schools. And for any other areas where you believe there may be some vulnerable populations or individuals that um, might have some challenges getting away quickly. Yeah, what about the, I mean, right there, the old, I'm sorry. old, the old folks community, it was right there. I don't know how they evacuated. So yeah, right where the fire was, like right behind, yeah. like, the fire and, the schools, and then, then there's old people. I'm sure that's what I think the other actions speak to. I don't know if they all have cars. I mean, I think, I think the community itself would like, I went to go check on my neighbors, you know, the ones that left, the ones that stayed. And then we had, you know, Mr. Case drive around, not this case, the other case, making sure everyone was safe too. So I think just, we live in such an awesome place and we all care about our neighbors that, you know, I mean, like I called the community center and they were all making calls to get the kids picked up. So I think everyone just went into action perfectly. But if, if there's anything that you can report back, Chief, that we can yeah. do to support, then I'd love to hear that too. Well, I think the first thing I want to make sure is that we've done excellent vegetation management around the perimeter of those, those, uh, those buildings, those schools, and the open spaces. So that's that's the first thing that gives us a fighting chance. Um, but I can certainly find out from Captain Papa Nicolau, the incident commander, and what, what lessons they learned or what considerations they have um, that they felt went well and those things that they'd like to improve on for any future response. Yeah. Perfect. And welcome back again. Thank you. Great to be back. Uh, you, when this is over, you guys mind if I actually take off? I have to go pick my daughter up from work. She started a new job quickly, and uh, she got off at about 8.30, and you know, she texted me a couple times. I just want to make sure. Go, that go. I, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Glad you're healthy. Go. Else, yeah. No, just go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Thank you all. All right. all right. Bye. Based on everything that we were listening to, were there any comments from the public? You have no public comment, though. Cool. Then the next thing I'd like to ask is when is the next, the date of the next meeting? Uh, the next fire commission meeting is on the first Tuesday of November, which will be November 2nd. November 2nd. Cool. All right, and then on to Park and Rec, draft minutes. Uh, any questions? Questions from the public? Looking for any raised hands, you do not have any public comment on the PR minutes. Okay, and then I guess Luke will be up for the Park and Rec maintenance activity report. That's me. Um, Yay. One. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I also have a few things, um, but the big one, we just on Friday had our big Halloween Harvest Festival, our annual Halloween Harvest Festival. And we did things pretty different this year, just um, trying to be mindful of, of health concerns and what people would want to be doing. So instead of having our normal indoor event, uh, we moved everything outdoors and held everything in sort of a, a trick-or-treat walkthrough with different booths uh, where kids were able to play little carnival games and get prizes and get candy, um, which was really fun. We did some where we created some of our own games and also rented a couple um, from one of the local like, bounce house companies that, that rent out um, fun you know, like carnival games where you throw the rings on the bottles and you try to um, get different things. And we had about uh, 10 different stations um, that kids could go between and, and get different prizes. And then we had a, a caution tape maze at the end and then a pumpkin patch where we're uh, people can go get a pumpkin uh, with a decorating kit on their way out. So the goal was having more of a walkthrough and we wouldn't have everyone congregating, but um, it ended up being our busiest Halloween uh, event we've ever had, which we weren't expecting. So the lines ended up being a little long for the stations and um, a little more crowded than, than we'd anticipated, but uh, everyone seemed to have a really good time. And even though we sold out of pumpkins, um, the people stayed till the end and, and uh, it was really good. And everyone went really well. And, um, and so yeah, it, was, it was a great event. I, I don't know the exact number, but we had um, uh, just around 300 kids came uh, to this event. So um, that, was, that was pretty great. And there's not a lot going on in the county for Halloween right now. Um, so it was great to be able to provide something and do it outdoors and do it safely. So I'm grateful for all the staff and all the volunteers. The Lions Club provided um, a handful of volunteers that were super great and helped us clean up and, and it was brave the cold uh, out there. And also uh, they donated a lot of candy um, for the event. So big thanks to the Las Vegas Lions Club for um, contributing to that. And uh, it was a great time. So that was our next event is going to be our um, fall art show uh, coming up on November 6th, and we're sorting out the details for that, but I'll, um, that, that should be really good, and we'll put out some information about that. That'll be an indoor um, event uh, in November, and then after that will be our winter fest. Um, other big news, on the same day as our Halloween uh, Harvest Fest was our last day of the 2021 pool season, so um, uh, we had a good turnout um, for the last day, and, and we shut it all down, and um, we're already making plans for, for the next one. So a big relief, um, got through a great season, um, and staff did really well, and, and I'm very grateful to all of them for getting us through the season, and for um, we got a ton of really positive feedback, especially this fall, being one of the only pools in the area operating normal hours, and allowing people to just show up and swim without reservations, without limiting uh, capacity, and without having a bunch of staffing problems. So um, glad we were really able to do that and provide a, a pretty normal season in spite of
uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and um, move on. And the classes are going great. We've got a lot of things going on. We're already starting our planning for, for our next next year set of programs. So it's kind of a year-round event, uh, our big summer planning process. So we've already started talks on what went well this year, what can we change and improve on, how are we going to navigate next year. And so um, we'll be announcing stuff as, as that comes to light. Uh, on the parts of side of uh, things, um, we mentioned the tennis courts earlier. They all look beautiful. Um, courts 3 and 4 don't look beautiful per se, but they're more playable than they were in um, course 1 and 2. And the Creekside Court all look really nice. Um, none of this is a guarantee that we won't see new cracks showing up at the first rains, or if it gets really cold. Um, these are just sort of temporary uh, repairs to help that our courts playable again. And, um, and maybe they look really nice and, and should uh, be playable for, for years to come. Um, but we will be starting to look at when can we do a full resurfacing job of some of these courts and, and on what time we can work with that with, um, with the budget. So we'll talk to you guys about that in the um, you know, later on in, in the fiscal year. But um, I'm glad to have gotten that done and, and the tennis courts have been packed. It's been a really busy tennis season. All of our tennis classes have been full. Almost all of our classes are full with wait lists, which um, is amazing. Uh, classes that we've never run, you know, not run in a long time have been filling up. And so um, there's a thriving tennis community in Marinewood right now and um, we're really glad to be offering so many programs and to be able to give all those people a decent course to play on for, for right now. So um, I'm really happy about that. Uh, the um, park maintenance staff uh, has been dealing with a lot of um, turf uh, maintenance this last couple months and continue to do so. Um, in the far part of the park, closer to the tennis courts, we're still um, letting the grass uh, grow and new seeds to germinate. I've got that all blocked off for the time being and hopefully we'll bring that up in the next couple weeks and then we'll shift to some of the other areas of the park. Um, we've also been uh, digging a lot of holes out there, uh, dealing with some, some irrigation issues and getting some things repaired and upgraded and adding some shutoff valves to, to help um, with all that. And the guys have been working hard and um, they've dug a lot of holes and been hanging out in, uh, about this deep in, in the turf um, uh, way too much recently, recently. So hopefully that we'll have all that done and not have to deal with that in, in for a little while. Um, we've also been dealing with shutting down the pool for the off season and getting things winterized down there to protect everything, um, checking all of our equipment now that we don't have people in the water and making sure everything's tip top minor repairs on some of our um, filters and pumps and, and things and uh, getting everything ready to, to go so that when we come into next season, everything will be um, in tip-top shape. So all that's been going well. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. So thanks, Luke. Comments, questions? Me, me, me. Um, for the tennis, when they do the tournaments, do they, um, like the, our tennis teams, and I know our Marine was really known for their tennis, um, do they rent the courts or do they just use the courts? When the uh, tennis leagues play, they, they rent the courts for both their practices as well as any tournaments that they hold. So they, they reserve those with us in advance and we post them out at the bulletin boards um, that they're reserved. And do they pay a fee? Like they the, do, yeah. All okay. the leagues pay so that kind of just, I was seeing if it covered, I mean, I, I don't know if it really covers all the expenses of it, but just asking if it. I feel like, didn't, they, didn't you have to say in the past that they like have helped us with the resurfacing costs and stuff like that they've wasn't yeah, so um, a couple of so the things that a uh, few things play into our ability to keep the courts in shape, and, um, and we don't have money to go directly into, into a tennis court fund. So, but the tennis, uh, so we have a Marine Tennis Association that is um, waxed and waned with how active and they've been over the years. We have um, done a lot of fundraisers. I'm um, mostly spearheaded by Jerry, our, our tennis pro, who's been really instrumental in, in you know facilitating those. But there's been a lot of support from the tennis association, which includes most a, a lot of the Marine Wood Tennis League players. And they've had um, a lot of fundraisers and have contributed uh, to our ability to, to keep the courts in playable condition. Um, they also their fees that they, they pay us to play also help with that. Um, we, the fees are pretty nominal, and, and we keep keeping them as reasonable as possible. Um, and as well as our, our revenue from uh, the tennis programs that, that we run through the rec department, like the classes that, that Jerry runs for adults and kids. So all those things together, um, I'll do to contribute to our ability to keep the course playable for sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question about the turf. So yes. when we open up and then we close off, I mean, it's super exciting to see everybody on there, but I feel like this last spring, fall, summer, there's really heavy use with tents and chairs and stuff. And I'm wondering how the new turf that you guys have seeded is going to hold up to keep people doing that during, I mean, I'm sure people are going to continue doing it until it's pouring rain on the weekends, right? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the turf obviously does great when no one is on it. Um, that's the, the best possible conditions. But uh, no, it should be issue robust. It's really about to run around and, and set up their stuff. And um, I mean, there's definitely uh, a lot of things that contribute to how well the turf holds up. But we're trying to, uh, right now, we're, we're doing a pretty concerted effort and closing it down for a long time just to get it to really okay. take hold where it'll be able to withstand um, the, the normal wear and tear, um, I think, pretty well. And we do a lot of treatment throughout the season without blocking it all off. But uh, this is sort of our post summer like, big recovery, and we're trying okay. to go well to get it kind of back into tip top. So okay. I'm just worried. So, I don't want I mean, all you guys' work to go for waste. Uh, no, we don't either. So I appreciate that. But yeah, no, it should be fine when we go back to people. It'll, it'll be okay. It's, it's okay. They'll do it again next year. That's right. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? Any comments from the public? You have no uh, comments from the public right now. So. Then Luke, I guess, nice report. And I'm glad everyone had a good time Friday. It was nice, windy, and cold. Uh, it calmed down right before our event started, thankfully. So it, was, it wasn't was miserable. So thank, <laughs> thank you. And it was packed. I mean, my kids, this is the first year. I shot a little tear that nobody wanted to go. But um, the neighborhood was packed. I can tell you that. Like, I was like, I for, like, for a moment forgot what was going on. And I was like, why are all these cars here? So it was, it was really nice to see, and all the kids were like rushing to go. So everybody looked excited, coming and going. Cool. So I'm going to guess uh, the next uh, commission meeting for Park and Rec is going to be October 26th. Is that? Good job, Bill. He got it. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I didn't list those because I ran out of room and I didn't want to push it. That's, that's okay. I was, just, <laughs> I was just making sure I got the dates right. That's all. Ah, you got it. Thank okay. You. Uh, now, board member items of interest, requests, and future agenda items. Anything from anybody? Uh, the only thing, and I meant to ask this earlier, um, can we get like a monthly update on the um, on the maintenance thing? Facility? Just, yes. <laughs> Definitely not a shed. It's going to be an incredible maintenance village. <laughs> yeah. Compound. I just know, I'm across the street from it. Facility. Facility. It doesn't work. have a roof on it yet. What's being done? The walls um, are up. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm just trying. The walls are up? In, the in interior area, walls I are up. I definitely do not mean to put you on the spot right here. You've had, this is a big agenda with a lot of stuff for you. So I'm saying, even if we just start it next month where you, you know, maybe you could just give us the, the updates. Uh, yeah, well, I, normally, I, I normally include it in a, you know, a little snippet on where we're at in my district manager report. I was actually, now that I look at this, kind of surprised that I didn't do it this
Yeah, I, I will add to that, Bill, just in saying that one of the things I've been talking and we've been revisiting is uh, uh, starting to piece together a uh, request for proposals regarding the east and west courtyards. Which one? The east and west courtyards. Oh, courtyard. Courtyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess that would be an item of interest for next month. And then maybe an update about the trails that the two parties had said that they would look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just write it down, sorry. And then if there's an update on whether we have to do the resolution every time, I guess, right? Resolution for? Do, continue right. to stay online. I think we have to do it until he tells us we don't. Yeah. I know. Well, I'm just every saying, 30 maybe, days. maybe there's an update. Um, if there's nothing else, oh, would the public have any items? Uh, I don't see any hands raised at this time. And then obviously we have a couple of recurring items that will be coming up next month. One I already talked about with any commission appointments from interested members of the right. community. And then in November, we always have to do a resolution uh, regarding the new health raises set by uh, CalPERS uh, Medical uh, Health. Okay. So those will be on next month's agenda, uh, as well a uh, PL statement from Q1. If there is nothing else, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. <laughs> a second. Call for a vote. Uh, aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. Director Ruggieri? Aye. Thanks. It sounds great. Uh, this All right. meeting is now adjourned. All right. Thank, thank you all. Go Giants. Yeah. Go Giants. Bye. Take care, everyone. Right. Bye now.